Today, we sit down with Joel Gondara, CEO of Morrow Capital. He came to the United States at just four and a half years old on a boat from Cuba. Find out how he turned the American dream into a swimwear and apparel empire. You'll discover in today's episode what it's like to have all your business on Amazon and one day it gets turned off. You no longer can sell there. What do you do? You'll also find out his secrets to his success and why the details are so important. Welcome to this edition of Peak Performance Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Thor Conklin here. We give you the tricks, the tips, the tools, the strategy, the technology, and the psychology peak performers use in order to get more done and execute at the highest level. If you know what to do but struggle with getting it all done, or simply want to raise your game to the next level, this podcast is for you. Sit back and enjoy. Joel Gondaro was just four and a half years old when he came on a small boat to the United States during the Cuban boat lifts in 1980, when over 120,000 Cubans fled the communist island in search of freedom. Growing up was rough for Joel and his family because his parents didn't know the language, and despite working very hard in full-time jobs, and small entrepreneurial ventures after work and on the weekends, money was very hard to come by. In the fourth grade, Joel realized he needed to make his own money if he wanted to buy those toys he always dreamed about. So he began selling collectible stamps, trading cards, figurines, and by high school, he was selling candy bars as well as buying stuff in garage sales and selling them at flea markets. Today, aside from owning 13 apparel brands in the underwear and swimsuit space, he also owns and is the CEO of Moro Capital, an investment company that looks to invest and acquire businesses in the apparel and e-commerce space. Joel, thank you so much for joining us today. I know the audience is going to get so much out of today's episode. Man, what an amazing background. I love the fact that when you're in fourth grade, you're sitting there and you start your first business doing, uh, what was it, trading cards? Yeah, that was one of them. It actually first started with... Uh international stamps you know stamps from other countries i was selling those to friends and then the next thing were garbage pail kids trading cards <laughs> i love it <laughs> i love it so what were some of the other businesses when you were uh, younger what did you start yeah uh the good thing is you know you learn from failures and and some of those things failed the stamps were a lot of work and a little bit of money but hey it was a start so that was good i stopped doing it after a little while the second one was those garbage pail kid cards it was there were cards that used to make fun of the cabbage patch dolls because uh, they were so popular so they made a, a satire making fun of them and they were extremely popular but unfortunately the school that i went to shut me down on that one uh but it but it's okay because i did it for a few months and made a lot of money in fourth grade and, and by a lot, I mean $40 a month. I think that's pretty good back in the mid 80s. And it was enough to buy my transformers on my own. So that was everything in the world I needed. And after that one got shut down, I went and bought some little figurines from a collection called Muscles. And it was these little muscular wrestler guys. And I bought a big, big jumbo pack. I did the math. You know, it cost, I don't know, $14, let's say. It had X amount of warriors, little figurines. And I'd realize how much they each were. And so I sold them for more than that. And I probably broke even and then kept some of them, but it wasn't a big business for me. So that was fourth grade. And from there I did other things. You know, the amazing regulation steps and it wasn't government regulation, <laughs> but it was the school shut you down. <laughs> Yeah, as far as I was concerned, it was definitely Big Brother, and I thought they shouldn't have interfered with me, but but they had it was up to them as their school. Well, you know what I love too. I love your background. You you uh, you were born in Cuba. Uh, you actually during the '80s actually took a boat from Cuba to the United States. I mean, what what a shift to now have every opportunity imaginable. You know, I talk with so many entrepreneurs in the United States, and they're like, you know, it's tough out there. I'm like, stop whining, <laughs> really. Well, Absolutely. Uh, I, I have a reminder every day to tell me how much tougher it is elsewhere. Unfortunately for people in the U.S. who are from here, they don't have this advantage. But hanging in my closet every single day since I was four years old, four and a half years old, and we came to this country, I have the shirt that I wore when I came on that boat. Uh, and that's still in my closet. I see it every single day. And I remember when I go get a shirt every day, I see that and I say, ah, man, I've got it pretty good. So, yeah, I, I don't complain about opportunities. It's amazing in this country. Wow. You know, I literally, I got goosebumps on my arms just thinking about that. What, what a great anchor and what a great reminder to have that sitting in your closet every day. 
Yeah, I'm actually thinking just to preserve it because it's been 36 years. I I might frame it. Oh yeah, a great great idea. You know, yeah. it's so interesting that you bring that up also, because I hear time and time again people go through things, and you either have one or two experiences, right? I went through something, and that's what's made me the man or the woman I am today. And without that event, I couldn't have done what I did. And then others go through something like that and go, well, you know, life is tough, and you know, maybe you might lose things, and it's really that was a difficult time. It, I think. The, the, our most difficult days and our most difficult challenges, those are our blessings. I mean, just those are the things that make us who we are. Absolutely. That, but that's an evolutionary process. In the beginning, when bad things would happen to me, because they happen to everybody, I didn't see that. I didn't, you know, one door closes, another one opens. I didn't believe that. I stayed negative for a little while and, and oh, poor me and licking my wounds until I started realizing, wait a minute. What just came back as a result of that negativity was something 10 times bigger than when I, where I was before. And I'll give you one example, and I have many, but uh, we were kicked off of Amazon in, our, you know, in one of our retail businesses online. And that account, when we were still pretty fresh online, was producing for us gross sales of 400000 a year, representing with, you know, we have pretty good margins in that business, it, representing about uh, 300000 of net profit. Well, when that we got kicked off of Amazon, uh, that was a very depressing couple of days for me. I was in a low place as a few years back, but but the, as a result, I started focusing on well, what can we do? We have to do. My back was up against the wall, and we developed some pretty good ideas. That now that four hundred thousand is shadowed compared to what we're doing today. So yeah, it's a matter of getting to that point where you realize the negative things, if you learn from them, are great. Well, yeah, and you're asking great questions. What can we do? What can we do to make mm-hmm. this better? You know, yep. I, I always say, I, I have a saying, I said, if you want to make God laugh, just tell her your plans. <laughs> and, uh, That's right. you know, because yep. we think it's like, okay, we got it this way and it's got to be perfect. And this is, this is, this is the way, right? Because we thought of it. And, yep. you know, one of my other core beliefs is that life happens for me, not to me. And maybe right. this road being blocked, this door being shut, maybe that's exactly what I needed in order to get me on the path that I really should be on. Absolutely. I'm, I'm always looking uh, as, as best as I can. I mean, we all get caught in the moment, but I'm always trying to figure out what, what can I learn from this and what's, what's great about this. So bring us through, you went from your trading card operation and getting shutting shut down as a fourth grader. And now you've built an incredible eight figure business. You have a, a venture capital firm as well. How did you go from the trading cards to where you are today? Uh, with very small steps. Uh, I did not envision where I'd be today. I knew one day I'll do something great. I thought I was going to be a major league baseball player when I was a little kid and that didn't work out, but I kept that hunger. That's the only way I can explain it because I thought I was normal and I thought everybody was as hungry as I was and as aggressive as I was, as hyper as I was. And then as life started going on, I started realizing, wait a minute, I'm always the first one at work, wherever I worked for. I was always the most trying to do the fastest job and the best job. And I started realizing, yeah, I, ha- I must have something. I'm, I'm very eager and hungry. So I just kept plugging away. And it wasn't this purely defined path that I was on that just worked out beautifully. Not at all. It was like a ping pong machine. I was the ball inside the machine. And taking very little steps, I got to where I am today. And everything I always see everything as a crossroad. I get today I'm here. I kind of have an idea, like you said, you have an idea of where you want to get to. You can't figure it out exactly. But every time I came up to a decision, a deciding point, do I take this opportunity or this one? I weigh them both out. Where do I have more to gain? Where do I have less to lose? And I go with that one. And if it works, great. Keep going. Yeah, I find so many entrepreneurs get stuck in what's working. Some of the worst things that can happen to us, right, is that it's all working. And it's like, okay, don't touch anything, you know, and opportunities come along. It's like, nope, what we have now is working. How do you have the, the guts to change things up when things are going your way and you come up to a crossroad and you just said, you know what, maybe there's a better way? Yeah, for me, I think it's innate. I think I was born that way. I'm never, I'm, I'm, by the way, I, I, before I say that, I am a very happy person. I have a great life. I'm, extru- I'm the happiest person I know. However, I'm never satisfied with the results that we're getting. I always want a little bit more because that's, to me, that's the fun of it. It's not even the dollar figure. We made, yeah judge it by dollars because those are points in the game so I look at that but 
but it's fun. I like to see things improve. I like to see, and even little things. I, I, I worry about all the little things. I love to think about the little things. Uh, our efficiency, picking orders in our warehouse. I love that we got it down to six pieces per minute when we used to be at two pieces per minute. You know, that stuff excites me. It's all the little things. I just enjoy having fun talking to my team and seeing how we can make things better. A lot of us tend to be big picture people, right? And we don't narrow down into those details. Is there anything that you can help someone that's, you know, the big picture person get into the details? What helps you? Yeah. Um, I, I am a big picture person. However, uh, through converse, and I don't handle the little things. I There's a school of thought out there um, where in my situation, the big picture person is called the um, the visionary, right? And the right-hand person or the partner that I have that handles all the day-to-day -day is the integrator. And that's kind of the situation I have. So I don't have to worry and, and, and do the day-to-day -day things. But I get back that report and I hear, yeah, look, we're doing much better on this. I didn't have to be involved in doing it. I just know that it's for the best. And by the way, I'm the only shareholder in my business. But every day I pretend that I'm the CEO and there's a, a, a board of directors, which there isn't. And I pretend that there's all these shareholders and there isn't. You know, I'm not in a fantasy world, but I, I put myself in that situation so that I can think, well, am I making the best decision? If I had outside people here, would they classify this as the best decision? And part of that is leading the team to make all the good little decisions. So that's why I worry about those little things. And and that I think comes personally, I'm very curious and I'm very nosy and I turn over stones and I dig around. So whenever I find something, I can have our team implement it and do something better to make it better. Well, you're married, aren't you? That's right. All right. So you do have a boss. That, that's who the chairman of the yeah. board is. That, that's the boss. Yeah, I was hoping you didn't bring it up. Yeah, she's in charge. And my four kids as well. Our four kids. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, we'll do more for others than we'll do for ourselves. And, and you have an entire team of there that's relying on you to make great decisions so you can continue to support them and their families. That's right. And to keep them excited because it, it would be horrible to not be growing because then they're not going to be excited. We just, uh, a few minutes ago, I just got back to my office here at home uh, from lunch with a few of our employees uh, celebrating something. So every time we have an opportunity, I bring up where we're at. We're actually celebrating our best month in our history, which was November. So we are celebrating that. And we do that every time we have a best month, the best quarter, best year. And I keep them motivated. And I tell them, by the way, guys, here's what's happening. We're talking to a couple of companies about possibly acquiring them or partnering in them. So this growth continues. You know, you, you have a very secure job if we keep this up. And everybody's part of it and, and keeps everybody excited. That's awesome. you got to celebrate along the way. And what I love and what you just said before is hunger and curiosity. Man, if there's two, if there's two skills that you can get into anybody that I, that I want to work for me is get them hungry and get them curious. I mean, that, that is awesome. Yeah, and type A to me, and that comes with that. Uh, I, as a kid, was hyperactive, um, like actually diagnosed as that. And thank God, I'm so happy. Back then it was tough. Everybody told me I was just too jittery and I, I couldn't sit still. Thank God. I'm so glad I'm like that. Yeah, you know, so often we find uh, kids that are ADD or AHD, and we have all these terms for them. You know, I believe, this is my belief, is we just might not be feeding them enough information that their brains can process. We're speaking too slow. We're giving them stuff too slowly. Speed it up. They're moving faster than we are or most people are. And I find when you do that, yeah, I don't know if you listen to audiobooks at all, but I'm at 2.0 on the speed. When I listen to audiobooks, I'm not the information coming fast. It's like 1.0. It's like, why is the guy talking so slow? <laughs> well, you're, you are faster than me. I'm between, depending on the author, I'm between, or the speaker, I'm between 1.25 and 1 1.5 on, on my audiobooks. But I do listen to several of them a month. Well, I'm from New York, so we talk faster yeah. on the way up there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> that makes sense. Growing up, did you have any mentors? I cannot say that I... Nothing formal that was called that, um, but I but I have been like self analyzing. Did I, you know, my, and I kind of figured out a few things just very recently in the last few days. Is that though my dad, you know, it was kind of like Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad. Uh, I didn't have that rich dad side. It was just poor because we grew up very poor, and my dad had a regular nine to five. However, 
I'm just starting to realize this as I grow older. Uh, my dad did was kind of entrepreneurial. He had on the weekends, he would do photography and do people's weddings. Um, and I would help him with that. Once I turned about 13, I started doing one of the video cameras and he grew it a little bit. But my dad always had, you know, old country mentality to, you know, you got to be careful, just make a little bit of money and put it away. He never expanded it and all that. So I did see that and I would see that, whoa, you know, this weekend my dad made $1,000 doing a wedding, you know, in the early to mid 90s. And so I saw that. And another thing is my dad's brother uh, was a mailman, nine to five. But on the weekends, he'd go buy stuff at garage sales and go take them to the flea market and sell them. And I kind of started following that model when I was in high school. And it just opened my eyes up to, hey, this is a possibility. This is a stream, a possible stream of income if you hustle. And so that, that helped me kind of imitate that behavior. Bring us back to the flea market days. I know you used to buy stuff at flea markets and, and resell it. What were those days like? And what were some of the experiences and lessons you got from that? Yeah, uh, I started doing that at, in high school, and it was just opportunistic, whatever I could find, but but it's like everything in life. Life's kind of opportunistic. you got to dig around and look for stuff, and you're kind of hunting for a treasure. None of it's major treasure, but just you know, nickel and diming, making a few bucks here and there, but it trained me for real life because that's what real life's like, and those frustrations, there was things that didn't make a lot of money, um, and then there was risk involved, and that that out of your comfort zone, you know, hands shaking. I'm 18 years old, 17, 19, negotiating with a 40 something year old person and, and nervous. And, and then that fear, you know, I'm, I'm making a $500 purchase. Is, is this even going to sell? You know, but, but it's good practice for life. You know, I want to have those practices and I want to break the seal at that age. Not, I mean, if you got to do it later in life, you do it later in life, but I'm glad I did it then and not in my forties or later in my fifties or, Tell us some of the lessons that you learned by dealing with uh, Amazon. Like in, in every, any failure in life, um, for us, when we failed at you know, being able to maintain an Amazon account, we're kicked off. Um, the lesson was that necessity hit. I've always, my life has always been about necessity. It's you know, to be able to buy a toy or two when I was little, to be able to have gas money or money to go out to eat uh, in high school so I hustled and sold other stuff. Um, once that necessity, it was a tough moment for me. My wife and I bought a, a house more expensive than any house we'd ever bought. Um, and about two months later, within two months, we were kicked off of Amazon, which at the time producing a good amount of income for us. Um, so that was tough. Uh, you, you have to start inventing and it's out of necessity that you invent. So we, I, I'm, I would brainstorm, how can we get out of this? What happened in that situation? We were not handling inventory in the best way, and we had a lot of old inventory. Yet, we were new to e-commerce, direct-to-consumer sales. We had been accustomed to just wholesaling for over 10 years, and that's when we realized, you know what, we're on e-commerce, we have direct-to-consumer sales, why don't we start doing these major liquidation sales and just getting back our money, maybe making a few bucks per product, because we need the money. We actually needed the money. And... Um, that's what happened. Uh, thanks to us, that bad incident that we had, we started killing it. I mean, you know, having $40,000 weekends on a little site that we weren't doing that before because we were getting rid of old inventory that our money was stuck on. All of a sudden, there's cash. And with that cash, we started acquiring other little businesses. And all that happened thanks to a huge problem that had me down for days. So you hit rock bottom and then you pick yourself back up and have better days. Yeah, you know, I counsel uh, people that have inventory all the time. It's like, move the inventory, move the inventory, move it, move, yep. it, move it. You know, it was funny. My son had uh, bought something online and he had the opportunity to sell it the next week for $100 uh, more than he bought it for. It's like a $200 item he could sell for 100 And he's like, you know, if I hold it for another year, I might be able to get $200. I'm like, dude, look, take the 100 now, reinvest it, do it again next week. And if you did that every single right. week, that would be $5,200 for the year as opposed yeah. to waiting a year to get 200 It's like move the inventory. Move it. Yeah. Move it. That's great advice. And you don't know what tomorrow would bring, but now you can turn right. it into right. a lot more. Exactly. Yeah. And not saying that you can do it every single time, but hey, you're not guaranteed it's right. going to be worth 200 down the road either. What's some of the best right. advice you've gotten in business? Um, I do – I have a, a – I would never really called him that. He doesn't call himself that, but a, a, really a mentor that's helped me. And and he told me just some down-to-earth, normal advice that just made sense. Um, he had a normal job, worked for a bank, 
college graduate, extremely smart guy, but just had a normal job. And he knew that's not where he wanted to end up. So he saw himself in a different place mentally and said, this is where I am and this is where I want to be. So imagine, take your left hand, this is where he is down low, take your right hand up, and that's where he wants to be. It's a long way to go. And he says, I didn't do it in one day. I just, every single morning when I woke up, I, I said, what steps can I take today to get me to that eventual success? And, I, you know, He's extremely successful. It worked out very well, and he just plugged away and got himself to where he wanted to be. So I like that. I, I'm not going to go crazy. Uh, I try to hold myself back from getting frustrated that we're not where we want to be today. Uh, but but it's getting there. Every day is better. So I like that advice. You just keep plugging away in, in the right direction, and you'll get there. Those small steps. I know uh, when we had the opportunity to meet in Chicago, one of the things I loved about you, you're on the other side of a room, and we're going through some training, and he said, look, just give me a list. Just tell me what I got to do. Give me the list and I'm good to go. And uh, I thought that was that was great because so often we can get so tied up in the stuff in doing our businesses and we forget. It's just about let's just get the list and just start checking them off. Let's just keep doing it. The small little steps. So that's, exactly. That's, I'm, that's how I uh, view all of life. It's not that complicated. Uh, I don't like talking about things. I like doing them. So I'm like that for everything. Give me the list. What do you need me to do? Let's get it done right now. And if I can't do it or someone else can do it faster and I can pay them a little bit, let them do it. But let's get it done. I love it. For the last 16 years, I've been driven by the question of why some people achieve amazing results and others don't. The answer 90% of their success came from their psychology. So if 90% of their success comes down to their psychology, what was the one thing that enabled them to produce the results that others were not? Their ability to execute. Their ability to get things done. Now, we all know how to get things done, but some of us do it better than others. And some of us are not even coming close to tapping our potential. So if you're truly committed to tapping your potential and really becoming a peak performer and getting the results that you need, want, and desire, take your phone and text the word BE Summit. That stands for Business Execution Summit. One word, BE Summit, and text that to 41411. I'm going to send out some additional information on our upcoming event that will truly teach you the science of execution. Thank you so much for listening today. I really do appreciate your time, and I hope you found today's show valuable. If you would like to receive these shows automatically to your phone or to your computer, simply go to iTunes and subscribe. After listening to several of the shows, if you're so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating, as this helps us reach additional people and spread the message. If you're truly committed to taking your life to the next level and doing whatever it takes to become a peak performer, but something's holding you back, something is blocking your way, and you just can't seem to figure out what it is, send me an email to info at and I'd be more than happy to get on the phone with you. We'll schedule a 15-minute discovery call. No obligation, no cost. I absolutely love to hear from the listeners, and if there's something I can do to help, I'd be more than happy to do that. Also, if you found something of great interest in today's show and you want to share that with your friends and family, simply go to my Facebook page, Thor Conklin. Click on the episode, hit the share button, and share it on your page. You can follow me at Twitter at Thor Conklin. The website is ThorConklin.com. We're constantly adding new free resources, discussing additional tricks, tips, tools, and strategies on how to be a peak performer. Remember, I try to keep these episodes short so you can listen to them during dot time, doing other things, commuting, driving, walking, working out. Decide to be a peak performer in all that you do. And until tomorrow, have an absolutely amazing day. That concludes part one of our interview with Joel Gondara. Please stay tuned later this week for part two.